My name is Roy Radcliffe. I'm here to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer this, uh, this later on today. And a lot of people have a lot of trouble with the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, if you don't know much about that story, come in this afternoon. I'll fill you in a little bit more of the details. Or uh, I have some books. Maybe you can buy, uh, buy one of the books later on. You can, you, you can read all the gory details that you want in, in that too. But uh, some people have a hard time comprehending the idea of forgiveness when it applies to him. So much of the time when we think about forgiveness, we, we put limits on forgiveness. Uh, you're not worthy of being forgiven. You, you've done too much. You've done terrible sins. I, when I was interviewed, I was interviewed an awful lot after uh, Jeff's death and, and after Jeff's baptism. And I remember one interviewer saying to me, aren't there some things that are just too evil to be forgiven? Uh, how do you deal with sin incarnate? That's what they call them, sin incarnate. And I remember thinking, wow, we're all sin incarnate. What makes you think his is worse than ours? I mean, what he did was gross and terrible things. And most of us can say, well, I never did anything quite that bad. But we have these measures about, of sin and so forth that, that God doesn't really address. To him, sin is sin. It doesn't really matter how far away you go. So where does forgiveness fit in? What does it talk about? What, 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 what do we do with when I first got the call about Jeff and I, I first met him uh, and, I, and I asked him, uh, why do you want to be baptized? And I'm getting a little bit into my afternoon thing, but uh, his answer surprised me. He starts quoting scripture to me. He talks to me about Mark 16, 16 and Acts 2, 38 and Matthew 28, 18. And I don't know if you know the numbers of the, the, what they've heard, but there's scriptures most of us are familiar with that talk about baptism. And I'm blinking kind of like, wow, you seem to understand what this is all about. And so I said, okay, uh, you convinced me, I'll baptize you. And he heaves a sigh, uh, an incredible sigh of relief. And I, I said, why'd you make that noise? And he said, because I was nervous about meeting you. Now, of course, the story goes, I was really nervous about meeting him too. And if you know why I was nervous about meeting him, you understand. He, he was an infamous uh, killer. And I'm an, alone in a room, just him and me. It's all there is. There's nothing between us. And so I'm very nervous and yet uh, he's nervous about meeting me. Oh, why are you nervous about meeting me? He said, because I was afraid you would say, I can't baptize you because you've been too evil, too cruel, too mean, too sinful to be baptized. Well, such a thought never entered my head. I never thought about that. Since then, I've met a lot of people who think I should have said, oh, you're too evil. I can't baptize you. But they don't understand God when they talk about that. So I told him I'd baptize him. He's a sigh of relief. It made me think about Psalm 32. So I want to start with Psalm 32, which talks about the blessedness of forgiveness. And then, and, I, and then I want to go into other ideas about forgiveness that sometimes we miss along the way. We talked a little bit about forgiveness this morning. We talked about the Lord's Supper and all that means. There's so much, so much depth of meaning in all of that that sometimes we overlook what it really means to people who, who have done terrible things and so forth. So this is, of course, one of the penitential psalms. By that I mean it's a psalm that David wrote after the Bathsheba thing. You know, <laughs> David is a wonderful person. David's name means beloved, and he's one of those characters in the Old Testament where he lives up to his name. I'm at, by that I mean everyone who meets David at first falls in love with him. We're talking about King Saul or Saul's son, Jonathan, or Saul's daughter, Michael. Or you're talking about even the king of the Philistines. One of the Philistines loves David so much. Uh, his own, all of his own men love him so much. David was a man who, uh, who, who signified love. And so everyone understands love. And of course, with Bathsheba, we have another kind of love that's going on there that shouldn't be going on. So uh, David, uh, of course, is caught in that sin and confesses to God and, and everything is forgiven. And David writes about six penitential psalms, and this is one of the psalms. And in this psalm, David writes, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom sins the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for night and day, or day and night rather, your hand was heavy upon me, my, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. He goes on later on to talk about how, now I'm going to tell everyone about how the Lord is so forgiving. But you have this sense of relief that comes over you when God has forgiven you. Probably the greatest gift we cherish among all the things God has given us is this concept of God forgiving us of our sins. 
Now, a lot of times we get confused about that. And I want to deal with that in a minute here. Sometimes we think, well, he says, I'm going to forget your sin and cover it up. Uh, later on in Isaiah, he would talk about, uh, I will send you, I will remember no more. So sometimes we think forgiveness means forgetting. God's going to forget the sin. Well, that's not exactly true. David writes these psalms, and these psalms are basically his prayers to God. And after the first one, do you think God says, what are you talking about, David? I've forgotten all about that. What do you mean, David? What, what sin are you talking about? Well, God didn't forget the sin. That's not what he forgot. What God forgot was the anger he had about the sin. I'm no longer going to hold your feet to the fire. I'm no longer going to have a grudge against you. I'm no longer holding you guilty for the sin you committed. That's what forgiveness is really all about. To illustrate, I don't want to get too personal, but to illustrate, once my brother did something against me that really irritated me so much that I was, I was enraged at him. How could he say such things? How could he do such things? Where does he come off saying such things as this? And I remember my mother saying, oh, come on, he's just your brother. You, 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 he doesn't know any better. And on and on she goes, you about making excuses for him. And eventually it dawns on me, well, he is my brother and I still love my brother. And so I finally say, well, I, I just won't be angry about this any longer. I forgive him. I still remember it. And if the time uh, you, you talk about it in the wrong time, I can still get angry about it. But I forgive him. I'm no longer angry at him anymore. That's what forgiveness is all about. I'm no longer going to hold you guilty of the issue no more. I'm not, I'm not uh, angry about it any longer. That's what forgiveness is really about. And there's a great sense of relief that comes to us when we realize that God is no longer going to be angry with us for that. What is it? Passes in the is it Colossians or Ephesians? He talk, well, I think it's Colossians. He talks about the various various things you should put away, put to death this and put away death that. For these things, the wrath of God has come. God is a wrathful person. Sometimes his wrath scares us. In the Bible class, I want to talk about the issue of justice and mercy and so forth. And the idea of justice brings up the wrath of God. Why, why is God so angry? Because you've done something wrong. That's why God gets angry about things. And, and God's a righteous God. And so we sometimes remember the wrath of God. And the wrath is something to be fearful of. The wrath is something, uh, something to be, uh, be uh, appreciative, to, to respect. But, the, but, but God is not primarily a God of wrath. See, that's where we disagree with the, the Muslims. All they see is the God of wrath. And the only way you serve a God of wrath is to kill anything that you think doesn't fit in with God. So kill the infidel. Whereas we Christians understand that God is primarily a God of mercy, not wrath. And that you then love your enemies because God loves the enemies too. So we have a completely different view of God, a particularly a different perspective about God. And that, that's very important. So primarily we think of forgiveness as a relief because God has forgiven us of our sins. So there's a blessing of forgiveness. But there's a second aspect of forgiveness that sometimes we're uncomfortable with. It's introduced to us in the uh, famous Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm from Wisconsin, and Wisconsin is big on Catholics and Lutherans. Don't know if you know much about Catholic and Lutheran things, but the Lord's Prayer, the, I'm talking about the one in Matthew 6, big, big deal. So big that every time they pray a prayer publicly, either they begin it with the Lord's Prayer or they end it with the Lord's Prayer, kind of like it confirms what they pray. Now, and we all pray together. You know, it's our Father who art in heaven. The whole crowd would do that all together. And so they really, and the Lutherans especially, we got a big deal about the Lord said, pray this way. So they interpret that to mean, well, you say these words. And of course, we understand it as a, a model prayer. It's teaching us how to pray, but it's not necessarily the way. You, it doesn't necessarily mean all prayers are going to be that way. But that, they used to interpret it that way. So they, they, they're real big on the Lord's Prayer. And well, the Lord's Prayer has something about forgiveness in it that sometimes we don't pay much attention to because he says, you know, after saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and so forth, your kingdom come, your will be done. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's the line. And after he finishes the prayer, then Jesus adds the comment about forgiveness. He says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Wait a minute. What's going on here? You mean forgiveness has some kind of condition to it? You mean I'm obligated to forgive if I've been forgiven. Is that what you're talking about? 
And Jesus would say, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's a passage in, in the, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, where ta- Paul talks about forgive others as uh, whatever things they have against you, as Christ has forgiven you. Here we have that idea and, and posed us again. It's really give, driven home for us in that p- parable Jesus told in Matthew 18 about, about the, uh, the uh, unmerciful servant, you know, the guy that owes so much money and he falls on and says, uh, be patient with me and I'll pay it off. And of course, the debt is so big. There's no way he could ever pay it off in his lifetime, given the average wage most people made at that time. You know, a denarius a day, which was a day's labor. Uh, uh, and it was many, many talents. I mean, he had lived several lifetimes to pay it off. And so it's impossible to pay it So the king simply, or not the king, the, the, or, or, yeah, I think it's the king, forgives him. All right, end of story. Oh, it's not the end of the story. Now he has a fellow person who owes him just a tiny amount that could be paid within easily a year's time of the average person's wage back then. And he won't listen to it. He pays you with me, I'll pay you. Oh no, he throws him in prison. You know, and you wait till you pay the whole thing. I mean, you gotta pay it off and so forth. And then the king hears about it. He calls him back on the car and says, hey, I forgave you so much and yet you won't forgive the other. And now what I forgave you of is canceled out and now you guys serve too because you wouldn't forgive. So you have this idea that forgiveness carries with it an obligation to forgive others. What's going on here? Well, there's a principle involved. When I first started preaching, I was taught, we Church of Christ people have a hermeneutic. And our hermeneutic is like three legs of a stool. You know, you got, the, uh, let me see if I can get it right, direct, uh, 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 direct uh, uh, commandment. Yeah, that's what it is. A ne- uh, approved uh, example and necessary inference. And of course, you get kind of confused when you try to go with those things. And, but as I began studying the Bible, and especially I studied Bible with other people from other faiths, I noticed that we're not looking for direct commandments and, and ex- approved examples and necessary. And we're not looking at that. Those arguments are only good, th- that argument is only good when you're looking for debate points. Instead, what we do is what's called the grammatical historical approach. We first of all ask, well, what does this mean? What are the words? What are the verbs? And what's, uh, uh, what is that talking about? Uh, how, how, does this, how does this apply? What are we talking about? So we try to figure out what the grammar is. And then we ask ourselves the historical setting. Who's talking? To whom is he speaking to? What are they talking about? We, so we say, okay, what's the context here? And when we understand the context, then from that, those two things, we draw out a principle that we live by. Okay. Peter wasn't talking to us on the day of Pentecost when he said, repent and be baptized. He was talking to other people, people who had crucified the Christ. They're the ones that said, what shall we do? He says, here's what you got to do. He said, repent and be baptized. And, but we draw from that a principle that says, not only did they have to do it, but we have to do it too. It's a principle we draw from that story. And most of the lessons we get from the Bible are principles we draw. Well, there's a very important principle that involves this forgiveness thing. And I take it to illustrate it, I take it from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, what's going on? Paul's writing to the Corinthians and he talks about the God of all comfort. You remember that one, the God of all comfort? I've often used this when people are, are facing grief. And I'll say, may the God of all comfort comfort you. That's what I'll write down on the card or I'll, I'll say to them. That's what Paul says. The God of all comfort will comfort you. But in 2 Corinthians 1, he says, so that when you've been comforted by the comfort of God, now you can comfort others. You mean the gift I receive from God, I'm supposed to use to bless others? Yeah, that's the principle. Whatever you get from God, you now give to others. This is the expectation God has of you. It's true with forgiveness. It's true with the comfort. It'll be true with other things like grace. Here's one of the things that sometimes we sometimes miss. What is grace? I'm going to be exploring that idea uh, in, the, in the Bible class. But basically grace is giving someone something better than they deserve. That's basically what it comes down to. You, want, you, you figure out what they deserve. That's the justice. Give them something better than they deserve. You treat them, you, you don't give them what they deserve. You give them better than they deserve. And so you're being gracious when you do that. And so we, of all people who've received grace, or are people of grace, should become a gracious people. We're giving grace. We should be a forgiving people. 
We should be a merciful people. I mean, all the various things we talk about that we receive, this is the principle we're supposed to give to others. And so forgiveness is something that what we have, once we've got it, we're supposed to give it to others. So we should be a forgiving kind of people. So when we hear a story about Jeffrey Dahmer, who did some terrible things, and I'll get more to the terrible things later on today, what terrible things he did. Is there a limit to how bad you can be before God will forgive you? Well, I don't find it in the scriptures as far as that's concerned. There's something called the unforgivable sin that we'll talk about later on, but that's not really not what Jeff was involved with. It wasn't dealing with calling Jesus Beelzebul or, or making fun of the work of the Holy Spirit, or whatever you're talking about, that gets more into what the sin of the Holy Spirit is. It has to do with, he just did terrible things. He killed people. He cut their bodies apart. He even ate some parts of the body. You know, just, you know everything he does, we, we hear the things, we go, Jeffrey Darwin, I want to spit him out of my mouth. I can't stand the taste of it. Oh, bad stuff. But that's how bad we feel about him. And yet, he turns to God. How dare he? He asks God, can I be forgiven? How dare he? What's the matter with him? How, what, makes, what does he think that he can do that even talk like that? Well, he's a person just like you and I who's done some bad things. And he starts to feel bad about it. Can God forgive that? So this passage here talks about forgiveness is something that God gives you and God gives it freely. Yet at the same time, there's an expectation on your part to give what you've received to others. Now this idea is shown in other places in the Bible. You remember that parable Jesus tells at the end of Matthew about the sheep and the goats? You know, the, all the people are called sheep. They're not really sheep. They're not really the goats. Some of you like, you divide one of the sheep over the goats. And to one says, he says, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you know, the whole thing. And they say, well, when did we do that? Well, it was when you did to one of these guys over here, you did it to me. And turns to the other says, well, I was hungry and I was thirsty and, was, and you didn't do anything about me. Now, when did we see you do it? When, when you didn't do them, you didn't do me. What's going on here? What they receive from God, they're expected by God to treat the other the same way. You see how God does that? When God comes into your life, God knows it's going to change you. And he expects you to show that by the way you treat other people, the way you look at other people, the way you're, you, 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 you see other people. That's what this sense of forgiveness is really all about. So forgiveness is kind of a deep thing. It's really an act of love on the one hand, love for one another because God loves. But it's also this idea of not being angry any longer. We're no longer holding our, uh, that person to the, the guilt of, of sin against them. We're, we're not going to address the anger problem at all. It's a decision we make not to be angry uh, about that anymore. And then it's an act of love uh, for other people. Now, some examples in the Bible of this that come up pretty clearly if you think about this. I don't know about you. I've got family. You've got family. We know what family's all about, right? Have you ever had anyone in your family sell you as a slave to strangers and then convince your dad that you're dead. See, that's what happened to Joseph. All right. Joseph is, is kind of the obnoxious little brother. He's got these funny little dreams. His dad gives him a special coat that is not just colorful, but also has seen, it symbolizes the idea that dad plans to make him the firstborn, even though he's like... Third, uh, tenth on the list, or something. He's really low down. You know, how can you be such an important person? You know, I think he's the eleventh, but it's out of twelve. How, how can you? And so they hate him. So they're off somewhere doing something, and Dad says, "Well, where are your brothers?" Well, I don't know. We'll go find them. Okay, so he goes, and he finally finds them, and they see him come from this. Say, "Oh boy, there he is. Let's let's let's, let's throw him in a pit." Let's leave him down until he dies. And one of them says, no, we can't do that. And they see a bunch of guys from Ishmael come, come by. Well, let's sell him. Yeah, we'll sell him. We'll sell him. Oh, and then we'll take his coat and then we'll dip it in blood. And we'll say to the father, hey, we found this out in the desert somewhere. Is that you recognize it? Well, sure, he recognized it. It's, it's my son. It's my son's coat. And Jacob mourns the loss of Joseph so profoundly that when his sons and daughters rise up to comfort him, it says, Jacob would not be comforted. I often tell people in funerals, don't be like Jacob. Don't reject the comfort of God. Don't reject the comfort that others give you. 
understand that there's comfort from the, that, that kind of loss. But Jacob, Jacob has a comfort, uh, has, has a loss that's so grievous that will last for years. So much so that when finally uh, J- uh, Joseph is united with his brothers, not really united, but he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And he pulls this little scam, you know, where he's going to have them, uh, he's going to keep Benjamin here and sit, let the rest of you go back there. And I don't give a rip about the rest of you. And one brother's going to say, no, you don't understand. This is going to kill our father. And he makes such an impassioned plea that Joseph breaks down tears and says, okay, 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 I'm Joseph. <gasps> they kind of believe what's going on. You have this moment of confrontation here. Was Joseph mad at his brothers for what they did to him? Yeah, probably. You can tell by the way he names his sons. He names his son about his bitterness comes out in the kind of sons he names and what, what goes on with them. Yeah, he, he was angry for a long time. And I'm convinced that he didn't change his attitude until he hears this impassioned plea from his brother about his dad changing his commentary. See, his commentary was his dad knew he was sold. But his dad didn't do anything about him. Didn't come down, didn't try to buy him back, didn't try to help him, didn't send an army after him. His dad gave up on him. So he's angry at his dad. And he's angry at his brothers for what they did to him. And he doesn't know until his brother says it that they all thought he was dead. So they didn't lift a finger to help him. He didn't know. But that changes the whole story. So Joseph then forgives his brothers. They don't believe it. You know that story. Okay, sure, right, right. But then they, so they bring dad down there and they, they, they got this land in Egypt and they live in, and they, things going for a while. And then Jacob dies. And the brothers say, oh no, oh no, he's going to get us now. And he's got to call him back again. No, I forgave you. Why does he forgive? Because he loves his brothers. He loves his family. Forgiveness is an act of love, you see. Another illustration. David. David, of course, means beloved. He's a guy who everyone loves and so forth. But some of them who loved him once no longer love him. He's one of Saul's favorite men until suddenly David's doing so well in battle that they start singing songs about David that makes Saul look kind of bad. David has killed, no, Saul's killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. And Saul's kind of like, what? singing that about for? What's going on? And pretty soon putting two and two together or connecting the dots or however Saul does it, Saul begins to see, see, wait a minute, he must be the one that Samuel talked about when they're going to rip the kingdom out of my hands and give it to a man that is after God's own heart. He must be the guy. Saul seemed not too dumb, see? So Saul starts figuring out ways he can get rid of David. So he starts doing things, trying to fix David. So David's going to die in battle. And David doesn't die in battle. David's real good, a good warrior. Sword. So he starts throwing like javelins at David. Twice he throws a javelin at David, stick, sticks in the wall. David's going to duck, almost die. And he's got to go hide, into hiding from, from Saul. And Saul's looking for David all the way. And there's a couple of times when, when he almost finds David, like in a cave and things like that. But, but he doesn't make it. And David kind of creeps up and you know, tears off his robe or, or you know, has his flag and so forth and, and confronts Saul and says, here, here, I could have killed you. You can see I could have killed you, but I didn't do it. And Saul said, well, you're a better man than I am. David still loved Saul, even though Saul tried to kill him. My dad was in World War II. Wasn't a great hero, wasn't nothing, just a normal guy in World War II. But he tells a, little story, a couple of little stories. One of the stories was that he, you know, uh, had to be a, he had to carry a rifle and so forth. And he had a, a guy, one of his company, that uh, one time got drunk and took and shot at my dad and hit him in the helmet and bent dimmed his helmet. And after that, that guy wasn't, my dad wasn't very friendly with him anymore. <laughs> I don't know, something about people trying to kill you makes you kind of feel bad about that, you know. He didn't like that. Well, why do you didn't like that? Well, because he's trying to kill me. That's why I didn't like that. We have a hard time with people trying to take your life. We don't like that at all. David, though, could look at Saul, who tried to throw a javelin at him and tried to do everything he can to get rid of him and still loved him anyway and killed the man who claimed to kill Saul. Forgiveness. Profound thing. Paul would write about how much he loved the Jews in the book of Romans. That he would, he, would, he would even be willing to go to hell for the Jews because the Jews, he loved, the, they were his people. He loved the Jews. And yet the Jews hated, uh, hated Paul for all he was. 
They, they would have strung him up. They would have, they would have killed him. They would have crucified him if they could have gotten their hands on him. They hated him. In fact, he had to run for his life from the city of Damascus. And on and on you go in the Bible stories about people who have forgiven other people. What a fantastic thing forgiveness is. It gives you tremendous comfort, yet at the same time, it's something that's imposed upon us that we're supposed to show love for one another. We're supposed to care for one another. Love your enemies. Well, do you know what an enemy is? You know, the old King James word enmity is actually built on the word enemy. The root of enmity is enemy. You, enmity is what you feel toward your enemy because your enemy hates you, you hate your enemy back. That's pretty much how the whole thing goes. And yet, as Christians, we're supposed to put enmity away. We're supposed to get rid of bitterness and rage and malice and all the normal things you naturally feel about people that hurt you. That's one of the things I want to talk about in our Bible class about this thing about justice. We have this innate sense of doing right and somehow doing right means I got to do unto you as you did to me. You know, the, the, uh, well, I'm going to give away some of my stuff. Talk. There's a passage in first, in rather Judges 15 and verse 6 about Samson. Big, mighty Samson. So, well, Samson caught a bunch of foxes one time and tied them together and set their tails on fire, let them run through the fields and burn all the, all the crops up. And the Philistines were mad about that. Well, you'd be mad too if all your crops suddenly got burned up. Oh, they're really mad. So they're looking for Samson. They want to kill Samson. And the men of Judah know where Samson's hiding. He's hiding in a cave. So they go to Samson and they say, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? And Samson has this wonderful line. He says, I merely did to them what they did to me. Now, reword that in terms of the, good, the golden rule, only it's not a golden rule. Do unto others what they do to you. You've heard that one before? It's not, this is not new stuff, is it, right? This is not, you know, this is, this is kind of normal. See, most of us live by that rule. You're, you're a parent, your little, your five-year-old kid <laughs> runs in the house and he's crying, what's the matter, Tommy? <laughs> Billy, hit me, Mommy. Well, go back out there and hit him back. Do unto others what they do unto you. Isn't that pretty much how we do things? And we usually live our lives that way. I was a director of a youth camp for 17 years. You know, I, uh, junior campers, middle campers, from nine years old up to about 15 years old. Guess what? Kids fight. Hope I'm not surprising you. Kids fight. And so you come on the scene, you, you break away, what's going on here? And both of them will say the same thing at the same time, pointing to each other and say, he hit me first. You ever heard that one before? They, you know, see, that's their justification. I'm justified hitting him because he hit me first. Well, how's this thing go? Uh, you hit me, ow, that hurts. Okay, now I have the right to hit you back. So I'm going to hit you back, all right? But you see, the fact that you hit me and you hurt me, I've got a little bit of anger there. So when I hit you to make it even, I'm not going to hit you exactly how hard you hit me because I'm angry. So I'm going to add just a little bit more to it than what you did with me. So ha, now, now we're even. And the other guy says, wait a minute. You hit me harder than I hit you. Now I have a right to hit you harder back because you hit me harder. So he's going to hit you back harder. But he's, but he's, he's angry now too. He puts a little bit more into it than he did before the other one did. And, so, and pretty soon you got the both swinging as hard as they can at you trying to be destroyed. All in the name of making things right. We don't judge very well. We're really bad at judging. That's why God says don't do that. You're not good at it. Oh, there's some things which we've got to judge at. Jesus would say, was it John 7? He says, stop judging by mere appearances, but judge with right judgment. So he expects us to use good sense when we judge, but sometimes we don't do such a good job. So we get all excited. Get, get, and so, and so uh, how, do, how do we you know, get two who are fighting each other, stop fighting, not just stop fighting, but to become friends and shake hands with them. Well, we've got to confront the idea that what you're doing. Well, so I usually say, well, you're both confessing that you're hitting and you're not supposed to be hitting. This is not, 
This is a Christian youth camp. This is not a Samson youth camp. Now I go back to the story of Samson talking about what's going on. You know, we're not doing to others what they do to us. We're doing unto others what we would have them do to us. See, that golden rule really is what forgiveness is all about. It's an unselfishness of putting self aside and thinking about what's best for the other guy. That's really what it's all about. And sometimes we, we, we miss that. Sometimes we forget that. There's a passage in 1 John where he asks the question, you, you have all these world's goods and you see your brother in need. And you, uh, the old King says, shut your bowels up is what it says. The idea is that you close your, your sense of compassion. John asks, how does the love of God live in you? You see, you receive love. You're supposed to give love. Remember the principle. Whatever you get from God, you give to others. That's the principle. And yet, You've got this love of God, and yet you turn your emotions off when you see someone in need, when you see someone hurting, you see someone begging. You know, That's not for me. I'm going to walk, walk away from that. And so you have a hard time. Oh, I didn't know that came apart. Look at that. Huh. I'm undressing here in front of you. I didn't even know it. Yeah. Shame on me. All right. Well, I'll, I'll fix that later on then. Okay. Let's see if I can kind of put together at least newfangled belts, you know, they... Anyway, I, I'm all embarrassed now, so just give me a moment here to kind of get my composure and remember what I was talking about because I've <laughs> kind of lost my way here. I hope you forgive me. <laughs> but we, we are people of love, and love is really what the name of the game is all about. I, ooh, I... See, I'm gone over time, so I should, I should stop and fix my pants and <laughs> shut up. So, so the, story, the song we're going to sing is a song that talks about you know, the, power, the, the, the love of Jesus, the, the uh, blood. I've been washing the blood, I think is what it is. Blood of the lamb. So, yeah, are you washing the blood? It's the blood of the lamb that takes away our sins. That powerful scene from the Old Testament where the children of Israel are, 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 they, they've got to take the blood of the lamb and, and sprinkle the blood over the doorpost. So that when the angel or the, whoever it is comes by, he sees the blood, he passes over. What a powerful image that is. And that idea is taken from that Old Testament story and applied to the Lamb of God that John the Baptist talked about pointing to Jesus. When his blood was shed, the blood covers your sins and the wrath of God passes over your sins too. What a wonderful relief forgiveness is. If you are struggling with guilt, if you understand the, the reason why Jeff sighed so much, you, you understand the, the, the blessedness of forgiveness. You understand why we need to receive forgiveness and why we need to give forgiveness as well too. Then we want to grant you that opportunity uh, that, and, and the others that will be able to deal with that. To, to hear the gospel and to come to and, and to receive forgiveness yourself because there's nothing nothing greater than what you can ever get than forgiveness. So obviously I, I need to stop because I need to fix myself, but let's, let's do our let's stand and sing our song and then okay.